Hello everybody, my name is Claire Lilly. I'm Director of Programme at Yorkshire Sculpture Park and I'm very, very pleased to welcome you all here this evening. Um, this is the fourth uh, talk by very important um, international artists who we invited to come to Yorkshire Sculpture Park, people who already had a relationship with us, um, and to come here to help celebrate our 40th anniversary. So these are very special talks, and we're really delighted that JAMA is going to be here, and we're really ending the series on a very, very high note, having him here. Um, I'm very grateful that you've taken time out from... He has a crazy life. Um, a lot of artists do, but I think JAMA probably more than almost anybody we've ever worked with, and he's sort of almost constantly circumnavigating the globe in different directions. So um, it's wonderful that you can be here with us. Thank you. Um, I expect that a number of people in the room remember the really astonishing exhibition that Jaume made here in 2011. I think it probably still stands as, well, in fact, I know it does, still stands as one of our most popular exhibitions ever. <coughs> Um, and if you think that right now we're attracting half a million visitors a year, and back in 2011, we think, I think we had around about 350,000 a year. It's, it's quite something. And in many respects, that exhibition was a, a turning point for Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Um, I subsequently have had the privilege of working with JAMA in Venice during the Venice Biennale where he installed um, in the Palladian Basilica of San Giorgio Maggiore the really a wonderful girl's head that we had, uh, the wire head that we had um, on the roof of the underground gallery. And together with that, he had a hand which came down from the cupola of the basilica. It was um, a, a real tour de force. It was an extraordinary thing that really stopped people in their tracks as they went into, into the basilica. And then in the building behind, which is called the Manica Lunga, this, the, the long sleeve, a long thin building, we installed a number of the alabaster girls' heads that you might remember that we had in the second gallery, in the underground gallery. Really extraordinary, heart-stopping uh, installation. And in Venice, it had the same kind of power and impact. Um, those are sculptures of girls of, who are just kind of at the brink of womanhood. And they, the models for the girls are, generally speaking, young women who have already lived in multiple countries. They have multiple ethnicities. They're young women who have already crossed many borders. And um, through their silent, dreaming faces, Jauma, I think, points to the potential of youth uh, and to the potential of humankind. I think Joma is one of just a handful of artists around the world who really understands the public realm. Um, he understands it as a place which defines and articulates sculpture, uh, where sculpture defines and articulates space, and where a set of ideas can play themselves out in this realm. Um, the public realm around Jalma's work is a place where people come together, where exchange happens, and sometimes where a kind of communion happens. And all around the world, I have seen the impact of his work in very, very different kinds of spaces. I've seen people laugh, I've seen people cry, I've seen complete strangers talk to one another, I've seen strangers hug one another, I've seen people fall silent, and that is the power of his work. And I imagine that a number of you have seen Wilsis, this wonderful seven metre high cast iron work that we have in the sculpture park, and which Jama very generously has loaned to us for the 40th anniversary. And I'm very pleased that Eva Soria Puch from the Institute Ramon Lal in Catalonia is here with us this evening. And thank you very much for your support in bringing that very ambitious work to Yorkshire. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate you being here as well. Uh, Eva has just come in from New York and I think she goes back to Spain tomorrow. So thank you. Um, we have Wilsis sighted on the southern shore of the lake. And there she exudes this extraordinary presence and wonder. 
and I'm really very grateful, Gemma, for you, uh, to you for lending her to us for this period of time. I um, thank you for taking time out to be here, and I'd like to invite you to come and speak. Thank you. gentlemen, I have to say that uh, you probably could feel that my English is a little bit peculiar, <laughs> but uh, my French is the same, my German, Italian, Spanish and Catalan even. <laughs> and uh, it was a beautiful writer that I love, Elias Canetti, who was saying always, I'm looking new languages to keep silent in. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's a contradiction that if today I have to talk about visual ideas, visual dreams with my words, but I hope you would understand my English, okay? Uh, when I did my show here, it was 2011, and it was Peter Murray and uh, Claire Lilly, Sarah Colson, and uh, the, the wonderful photographer, John T., who is always nearby. Uh, who embraced my work, and we, I had an amazing capacity or possibility, I don't know how to say, to, to create a dialogue between my background of the Mediterranean landscape with the British landscape that is this park. As you know, this park has been designed. And, uh, and, and, and I guess that this park is an art piece in itself. And, and uh, I don't know the other artists, but for me it was a terrific uh, possibility to dialogue with. And um, Claire told you that uh, uh, they are displaying now Wilsies in the other side of the lake. And uh, I'm really proud that they wanted one of my pieces for the celebration of the 40th anniversary. Uh, Wilsies represents pretty well my work today because I'm trying to, to produce silence in some way. Uh, silence means that uh, our body is a kind of building, uh, fill up of uh, dreams. And... What did she say? In the platform? I, I don't like the platform. It's horrible, it's horrible. I need to move. Okay, okay. Well, I actually will see is a, is a very young uh, woman coming from Dominican Republic to Spain to try to find a better life, as many others. And, uh, and, and, and we'll see represents many of, many of the portraits that I'm doing in the last, uh, I don't know, I started in 2004, 13 years and working in that way, trying to catch this idea of uh, self-portrait through the others. Well, you see that, that girl, it has the eyes closed in a kind of dream state position. And, and, and I guess it's a beautiful uh, uh, metaphor about that every one of us is like a mirror in when we can reflect our image. That is a little bit the concept. And that is the excuse that I'm today here to talk. But uh, I wanted to look at back uh, in my show in 2011. You, I don't know if some of you visited the show at that time, but that was one of the sculpture House of Knowledge. At that time, <clears throat> I was working a lot also with text, but not with, uh, uh, let's say, quads or, or, or real text. I was working with letters, uh, trying to talk more about the biology of the text, about the cells. Every letter was a cell that, uh, together with another, had the tremendous capacity to create more complex bodies. And, and that was one of uh, fantastic pieces right in the hill that was uh, uh, in a very incredible place to watch all the park below. And it was fantastic, even in the night in this image with the fire. Uh, uh, one, one of uh, my uh, main interest is the idea of the dialogue, the, to talk. Uh, now, it's a, a lot of people there and I'm here, but we are creating a certain conversation together. Uh, in my work, I'm insisting a lot because 
I, I always dream about when you are in front of a mirror, you have a conversation with yourself or, or with your shadow or with your dreams. I never forgot this beautiful image of Peter Pan trying to catch the shadow that was in one other side. And when, uh, when you lose your shadow, probably you lose your life. And, and the idea of conversation for me, the other is the shadow of yourself. It's the representation of ourselves. And, and, and this, this piece was in, 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 in Yorkshire, now it's in Toledo, and, and it was this idea, Spiegel means Miro. And, uh, and, 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 and I like when somebody is interacting with my work in that way, this little girl was beautiful in Rice University with another piece, or some fans <laughs> that I collect over here. Thanks to Yorkshire, I, I have a certain new audience. <laughs> And uh, I love this picture. And okay, that, that is a, well, it was 2012, uh, and, and I did this installation at Place Vendôme, which was very important for me, with the central piece. With instead than to use uh, alphabets or letters, I was using another kind of alphabet, which is the music notes and straps, creating this image that now is in Istanbul, for example, or, or this this piece in 2014 in Tokyo with the idea that letters are part of our body in the way that we, we are part of one land. We come from the earth. And the letters has an elongation, as you can say, and becomes like roots coming out from the earth and building up the, the, the human body. I, I think it's, it was a beautiful experience that I repeat several times. Like in Montreal, recently, I just opened that installation last September in Montreal. Look at that, the piece is in a conversation with the city again. Or, or, or this idea of twins, the piece and the others. And, and, and it's always open to, to try to embrace. That is at the MIT in Boston. And it's right in front of the entrance of the main building. Uh, and, 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 and kids are, are pretty interesting when they go there for applications or uh, with the parents to visit them. They always take pictures in my piece. I love that because the piece, you can go in and you take a picture and that becomes a little bit the memory of MIT, which I guess art has this tremendous capacity to embrace, I don't know, the, the perfume of one place. Well, new, new fans that I have in my work, that is in south of France, in Antibes, and uh, here were ships, but there was birds. And it's, it's a piece which is a lot of birds. I, and I, I love that piece because I, I, was, face, I was installing the sculpture facing the, the Alps and the, and the Mediterranean Sea. I guess it's a, an incredible spot. Look at that. It's just fantastic. Okay. And because many times the sculpture seems that it's frontal. Look at this frontal. And, but the sculptor sometimes is showing the direction to look at that. I mean, I love when you find the sculptor from the back and then you have the, the, the wish to see what, what the sculptor is looking at. Because finally, he's representing a little bit my wishes. That is in Japan, it's a little island in where I did a little island in the island, which is this little pavilion. You see, following a little bit the beauty of the this kind of very low constructions that they, 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 they have over there. And this little pavilion, it's fantastic because you see, it's just projecting the shadows of the letters inside. Uh, that, uh, for me, is the, my personal self-portrait, okay? Because in that image, you can see perfectly that it's like a, a selfish, and one side, it's physically real, and the other is the reflection on the water, and, and the, the silhouette that you can see is myself walking inside. And it's just the protection of, of, of a house, like, uh, I don't know, a, a mole or a selfish. And, and I, I've been using many times that concept. Uh, but in that case, I guess it was pretty interesting because I've been using a virtual image and a physical image. And water, it's always very helpful in my work. And the shadows. Okay, the shadows that I've been using a lot in the curtains that I'm doing since many years about poetry. 
uh, I mentioned many times that I've been probably much more inf influenced by poets than by other artists. My, my father liked very much books and I had uh, the capacity or the possibility to read poetry pretty young and, and uh, incredibly the capacity that a poet has to really uh, develop a wall and introduce your dreams inside that wall. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing this kind of curtains, really paying homage to the poets. Uh, the only problem for me with poetry or the books is because you always are reading the text in a certain frontality. They are a stick it on a white wall and you don't know how a leather looks in the back. And I try to, to put those letters or this text into freedom and they are free, they are just floating around. And I did that long, long wall in the National Scout Center in Dallas and that was the wall that I did over here, that in Yorkshire with the jaunty pictures. And, uh, and, and I remember it was a beautiful piece all along the corridor in the, in the main gallery. Okay, uh, the same piece in one or another position, it's changing, and when people are uh, passing in between, they, they, they touch the curtains, and, and the curtains and the leathers produce this beautiful sound, ding, 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 which is the sound of the leathers. It's really the sound of the text. Uh, many times when I'm thinking about what text means, if you think a little bit about it, it's the, it's the partition of the music of our boys. A musician, it's, it's passing the sounds into a partition with notes in between the straps, etc. But our way to write the partition is writing the text, and the text is the music of our boys. That piece it was in New York, and I think it was a, a great piece because I, I've been doing a, something similar like I did in, in Japan, using the shadow in the same uh, uh, importance of the real piece. And this piece called Talking Continents was projecting on the ground beautiful shadows. I still remember when I did the opening, it was an artist in New York who came for my opening and said, Jaume, wow, I love your piece, if tomorrow you miss one of the shadows, it's me who is stole it. <laughs> and, and I think it was very beautiful, I mean, because the, 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 this idea to penetrate inside the text, but the text not as something academic and rigid, the text as the only way that we have to really express our dreams. It's probably one of the most important parts of my work. Okay, I, I'm also showing those pieces are much before my show in, in Yorkshire, but I use one of those installations in the main gallery also, that it was the vibration of the materials. Uh, you probably remember William Blake, one of your more important poets, said something extraordinary. He said, one thought feels immensity. Uh, I, I guess it's one of the most beautiful expressions that nobody said before because we have this tremendous capacity to fill up the space with our energy. You don't need to say nothing, just our energy is filling up the space. And I guess sculpture is strongly related to that capacity. An object probably means nothing, but if in this object you have the capacity to breathe this energy, and that energy spreads all around, filling up the space, not with physical elements, but with energy, that's amazing. And, 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 and I guess the gongs or the cymbals, it was a fantastic idea about that because when you beat with the mole the gong, this vibration is expanding all around as, as we have with our, our ideas, with our thoughts. And, and I did many times, that was in Yorkshire, I guess the person over there is Claire. And, uh, and, and it was beautiful to, to, to enjoy beating the gong and I don't know why people start to smile immediately because it seems that they were waiting all their life to do that moment. <laughs> and, uh, and with the symbols as well, but the symbol was more the concept of a metronome, which is regularly, some, you, you can see some droplets were falling from the ceiling and percutting the, the symbol regularly, every eight, nine seconds. Bing. Ping, etc. And I was using 
you can see etched on the symbol poetry of William Blake from the Proverbs of Hell. And it was beautiful because when you are eating the, the letters and the symbol, finally you are changing the sound of the symbol in a very subtle way. But every symbol has a different sound, things that you remove some of the metal. And, and I did installations, that, that is it's a permanent installation in Dubai, representing the 196 countries in the world, that as far as you could not do a representation, I like it to, to talk about the vibration of every country in the world. And, and it was beautiful, look at the guy over there, he's a guardian. And I, I'm, I'm always joking because <laughs> it's a, the, this piece is at Mission Impossible 4 and Tom Cruise is passing through. And it's the best moment in the movie, even if it's only for seconds. But <laughs> I guess it's a, it's a terrific installation because when people go to their home, uh, because it's the, 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 the entrance lobby for the apartments at the Burj Khalifa that you probably know is the tallest building in the world, is something, well, it's like this guy, huge. Okay, and, and you, you have this strange vibration in the lobby because the, the droplets are falling and, and are creating a very strange and very soft uh, kind of sound. Okay, this, this idea of circles, which uh, I, I've been using many times, it was, for example, in that project that we did a long time ago with Norman Foster in the Italian Alps in the snow. I was dreaming to try to, to create the most precise portrait of one place uh, in the landscape, like a stamp, and, and I decided to use the, the GPS position of Norman's studio in London, my studio in Barcelona, and the site in, in Italy, which was Sestiere, a very beautiful little village nearby Torino. It was the Olympic, uh, well, the Winter Olympic Games at that time. And we create this beautiful image, those guys making the letters, and, 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 and it was a terrific piece uh, that melts one week later. Okay, and, uh, and, and, and I, I think it was also a very interesting exercise because many times, obviously, sculptors are created uh, to, to remain in some ways, but uh, sometimes sculpture is just an attitude, it's not a problem of objects. Objects, and, and it's when you say sculpture, it seems that everything is heavy, is big, it's complicated. And, 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 and I, I like it so much to do that project because one or two weeks later, the piece was melting, melting, and returned to, to its original position, which was just the snow. And uh, this kind of icy uh, color, the white color, the idea, is pretty close to my fat angels. These kind of angels that are so fat that they have not the capacity to fly and that gets a stick on the walls. And, uh, and because I think it represents very well uh, humanity. Uh, we, we are not perfect, uh, absolutely not. But with our imperfection, we have this amazing capacity to illuminate life. And I think it's a, it's a piece, plenty of hope. And that it was in Yorkshire. And, and in, I, I probably did much dark than I did in, in Nashville recently. But I love when somebody, I, I, I love this picture, that is a person in dialogue with the angel. And, and the angel is with the hands uh, in, in the eyes because he's a little bit a part of us. But this person, I think it represents very well my intentions in the work. <coughs> Is, is, the, is the figure illuminating her in that piece. And then uh, those pieces, that, it was for several years, that piece in Yorkshire. Now it's back to my studio. But it, and, and it's this piece which was changing colors in a very gentle way, you probably remember, in the entrance of the park. It's the same piece, but the colors are changing. And, uh, and, and I love those pieces because whenever I install pieces like that, it's like, uh, I don't know, angels that they are thinking about us, but in a very uh, 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 distant way. In the, and and I, I love to call those pieces poets, because you probably agree with me that poetry is a very strange part of culture, because poets are working all their life and nobody knows them. 
and probably 5, 10, 50, 100 years later, everybody realized how important they were for their generation and how strongly they helped to transform one society. But it takes so much time. And I, I like this idea that they are looking up from above in this kind of conversations, uh, changing colors in a very gentle way. I think it's beautiful. OK, this kind of verticality was also part of that idea of the heart of trees. Heart of trees is born with my idea about alchemists. As you probably remember, alchemists was a group of people that were dreaming uh, about other possibilities with our existence in the, middle, in the Middle Age. And people are only thinking that they were transforming lead into gold, but that, that it's a, a beautiful metaphor. But the main thing was that they realized that from the death material, from the mineral, a new life was coming up. And they give this beautiful image of the tree. And the roots were fixed on the mineral in the death body, the trunk was like a bridge, and the branches embraced the cosmos. I think it's beautiful because many religions, many ideas, uh, was talking about that. And, and I decided to do my self-portrait cast in bronze, embracing a real tree. OK, uh, why? Because, uh, well, that is in different places in the world. But OK, let's talk about this one, for example. It's myself in cast in bronze, which apparently in the main sculptural tradition is, is, a, is, a, is a quite stable material bronze. That means that <coughs> gets fixed in one site, in one volume, in, in, in one weight. But what's happened with my soul? My soul continues to get more information, more experiences, is growing and growing and growing. Where, in where I am keeping my soul in this body that gets fixed in one specific size, and I, I love to imagine that a soul could be a tree which continues to, to be alive and grows and grows and grows. <clears throat> okay, that, that was just a show for six months or whatever. But uh, in many places that I have permanent pieces like that, the tree is growing. And uh, at home I have one to check if everything is fine. And, and, and the trunk took completely the space already, and the figure is already a little bit like that because the trunk is taking the situation. And, and I think it's beautiful because <clears throat> finally the trunk will eat completely my figure, my face, my arms. And I guess it's, it's a beautiful end uh, for a piece like that. Nature and culture, which normally seems opposite, are, are trying to get together. And, uh, and, and, and apparently, it seems that I'm embracing the tree, but finally, the tree will embrace me. And I think it's, it's pretty interesting. We need to be a little bit passionate. It takes a little years. OK. Well, you probably remember that was a project that I did many years ago. And, uh, and I still remember that we met with Peter Murray years, many years ago in London. And he said, John, I've seen your piece in Chicago. Maybe we have to think about the show in Yorkshire. OK, that's the reason that I'm projecting that piece, that it was a project in Chicago in 2004. I spent almost four years working in that project. And it was the idea of the duality again, the idea of conversation, trying to reintroduce in the public space the gargoyle. OK, I was, I've been filming 1,000 people in town, the faces. I scratch the faces. I elongate the faces, and all of them obviously had the mouth in the same place, and suddenly they were spilling water from their mouth uh, to try to get back the idea of gargoyle in the public space. And then in between, it, well, that, wait a second. In between the two towers is a reflecting pool, three millimeters thick, that means that you can walk with your shoes. And, uh, well, that is my personal dream, to walk on the water. <laughs> Because I don't swim, and it's a, it's a shame for a Mediterranean guy I don't swim. But finally, I've got the possibility to walk in the water. And then it was a fantastic project because everybody was a little bit concerned in the beginning. John, but that project is so technological. It, it, nobody would understand. It's, it's so avant-garde in that way. And uh, I remember the day that I, I took out the phase and kids arrived. 
It was so successful thanks to the kids of Chicago. And I've got a new group of fans, which are the kids in Chicago, which uh, are enjoying and understanding the rhythm of the piece. For example, you can see uh, over here, it's starting on all the kids are waiting the moment that the face is putting water. And, and, and it's just uh, an emotion. Okay, the first day, all the kids were dressed normally, but parents understood the problem, and now they let them a little bit more casual. And, and it's an explosion of happiness. Okay, and, and, and it's not anymore the sculpture, it's the relationship with water, it's, it's the relationship with probably the main component of our body, which is water. And, uh, and it's also ter terrible and fantastic, the idea that the, the reflecting pool is a common place, is a, a, a gathering place in where everybody is welcome. And when they are walking, it's not from one or another part of the world, it's one more of us. And I think that was a really a beautiful piece, which I connect with uh, Benis. Claire was talking about that collaboration with Benis. Uh, Water again. Uh, that is uh, San Giorgio Maggiore, which is one of the most beautiful basilicas in Italy from the 16th century. And I installed one of my mesh heads. Uh, I, I like it in the Claire's text because she said it's not a sculpture, it's a volume of air floating there. And, 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 and we even calculate how much air was embracing the piece. Because I always like, uh, the, you, you must to, say, uh, to know that this uh, church is a real church. It's not uh, a church, abandoned church. It's a church that has the mass every Sunday, I guess, and it's a Benedictine community of monks living in, which is an active. That means that I wanted to really do a an, an specific side piece for this specific kind of religion. And, uh, and thinking about religions, I guess light is so important. The idea of transparency in our uh, idea of uh, humanity. And, and look at, uh, when you look at, uh, uh, through, the sky, the, through the head and you see the door, all the light passes through. And also when somebody's on the other side, you can see perfectly. And, uh, and sometimes a species seems like a hologram. You probably remember I installed one of those heads in, in Yorkshire at that time. And then Claire also mentioned the blazing head that I decided to build up for that uh, place uh, uh, below the cupola. And, and it was beautiful because the, the church has some paintings of Tintoretto. And, 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 and I love this picture uh, because the hand, it really seems floating in front of this masterpiece of Tintoretto. And, and, and when he's center, projecting the shadows in both sides, is again this idea of the dialogue that I'm always trying to catch. In the other side of the church, it was a long, long corridor, which was, we call it the Manica Lunga, which means the long arm in some ways. And, and, and believe me that when they show me the, the, the space and told me, Jaume, we like to do an installation over here. I thought it was a punition because it's the, 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 the worst space I've never seen in my life. It's three and a half meters by 57. <laughs> and, uh, and when I, and I uh, uh, spent one or two weeks after, and I, I passed my depression into more positive attitudes, <laughs> I decided to do something very radical. And I decided to close all the doors all around and to keep only this long, 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 narrow space. And, and I installed portraits of this kind of young woman as Wilsies that we have in Yorkshire, but covered in alabaster. Alabaster, as you know, is a very, a very soft uh, uh, stone, but very translucent. The light passed through, really. And, uh, and you probably can recognize the figure of a man nearby to the second. To understand the scale, it was about two meters tall. And, and, and that means a very human scale. And, and the entrance was more or less where I am now. And, and when you walk in and you see this long, long, long line. And I learned a lot in that, uh, in that installation because I wanted to give the feeling that every head was at the same distance one to the other. 
And I understood why in the Renaissance in Quattrocento, Cinquecento, they have so much problems with the perspective. Because if you did that with real calculations, it was wrong always. And, and finally, we, we, I did by I myself, and it was a progression as Mario Merz did years later with the Fibonacci. It's amazing. And we did just by intuition, no, no, a little bit farther, a little bit farther. That's fine, okay? And what it was fine was exactly the right number. It, it was, a, 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 believe me, one of the miracles in my life. <laughs> Look at from the back, and, and, and it's a beautiful installation. And we were collaborating with Claire. Okay, that is the second miracle in my life, which was this installation in Rio de Janeiro. It was for a show, a six-month exhibition, and they asked me uh, where in the city I wanted to install the piece, and I said, in the water. Okay, why? Because, I don't know, probably water is the only thing that don't belongs to anyone. I think it's part of all of us. Maybe this water was in Barcelona one week before, in, in, in England, uh, in the between, and then in France. I don't know, it's always moving. And I love water in that concept because I guess it's the most clear public space in the world, the water. And, and okay, the curator was a little bit unhappy, not because of the water, because all the permissions that you need to install something in the beach or whatever in the world, but especially here. And um, because if you think about Rio, you think about the sugar low or the Corcovado, and, 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 and they really give you the right place. And first, because it's a new island in, in the island, like in Japan, uh, the water around, which is my dream, you see the Corcovado over there in the corner, you see, and the piece was facing the Corcovado with the sugar lawn behind. I, I guess that, that is really the, the spirit of that city, Rio. All the favelas are in the other side, but the water, because all this beach is plenty of guys. Well, I've been many times because the first, the first trip that I did outside the Spain was when I was 20. And it was uh, to Sao Paulo and Rio. I was incredibly interested about all the religions that mix Afro and Christian mix that when it was the first slaves in, in Brazil and the Portuguese went there, etc. And I, I spent a little time over there with, the, with all these ceremonies of Macumba, Canomblé, all those things. And I remember one night in Rio de Janeiro, I was 20 years old, and with a friend uh, watching all the offers that people was putting in the, in the beach, which was a candle with a bottle of cachaça, which is a, an alcohol that they drink from the sugar can. And, and he said, but why, why they don't drop that to the water? Because this, I asked, he said, no, it's an offer to the divinity of the water. And they said, no, 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 we wait that the water will collect all these things, changing the level. As you know, every six hours is changing. He said, wow, the, the divinity of the water is Iemanja, Iemanja, which is a mix also with this idea Afro-Christian, I don't know, which is, uh, it's like the Virgin of Carmen with the moon, with the foot on top of the moon, which, well, it's a very classical image in, in that kind of uh, religion. But Yemanja. And I've been waiting, well, I did that when I was 58, 38 years to do that piece, which is a long time. But when I, when, when I installed the piece, I said, we got it. And, and it, was, it was really very moving when uh, just finishing the installation at seven o'clock in the morning because the tide was changing and we had a lot of problems. Um, it was a guy walking in the beach uh, saying, but what's that, what's that? And was the, the correspondent of the French press in Rio. And he took pictures and immediately the pictures were all around the world. And, and it was very funny to see how much the concept of public space are changing also. Maybe because it was Yemanja, the divinity of the sea. She wanted to, to really be everywhere with the sugar low. And it was a very, a very important image around my work all around. 
Okay, the piece uh, after the show was going to Chicago to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Crown Fountain. And, and, and I decided to install the piece over here, which is, you see the street that splits Chicago in north and south. As far as I had not the possibility to be near the tropic, I decided that the, the, the street which splits the city in two is the tropic of the city. And, and, and I guess it was a beautiful installation. It's the same sculpture in a different site. That I learned also a lot about that because normally I'm working site a specific project, but in that case, it was incredible. And uh, okay, the museum in Miami fell in love with the piece, acquired the piece, and now it's there. Okay, in a completely different <laughs> concept as well, surrounded by palm trees, right in front of the museum in Miami. And I decided also not to be closer to the building of the museum, but to the water of the harbor. And now the piece is facing the entrance of the, of the harbor, this bridge, which is a beautiful bridge. That is a view from the bridge. This is the building, the, the Miami, the Paris Museum is in Miami. And, and, and it's the final place for a will, uh, the, the, this girl which was dreaming to be Iemanjá in, in, in Brazil, and, and, and to be for two years in Chicago with a terrible winter. And finally, she found a warmer place in Miami. <laughs> okay, that, that is a, a piece that uh, I start to develop in Yorkshire. I still remember that Peter and Claire visited me in Barcelona and I had one of those heads. It was the, the beginning for me of that. I spent nine months to do the first of those heads. It was really a fight because I, I'm, 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 I'm to work with the girls I'm scanning the girls and then I'm working with the 3D material in my computer and always watching this 3D mesh in my computer as something virtual that makes me crazy and I wanted to really touch, to really caress this, um, this mesh in, and I, we spent really a lot of time and, and, uh, and, and, and I remember Peter that was completely fascinated about that and, uh, and, and it was one of the pieces. That is in Nashville, on top of a pond that they had in the, in the park. And the night was beautiful because it was completely surreal. It was impossible to, to understand why the pieces were floating. That was in Chicago. I, I, I did since years, um, during many years, uh, this kind of work all around. And that is the piece that I did for uh, Yorkshire, probably you remember. And, and I guess the shot of Yonti is amazing because it's the cedar tree with, that you have over there inside the head and, and all the landscape. Because as far as a, a design landscape, I, I guess it's so extraordinary to see the landscape in the head. Well, I, I, for me, it's one of my preferred pictures and projects, those two heads on top of the main gallery. Uh, it was fantastic. Okay, years later, I did that project in Calgary. Uh, uh, it was Foster again, but he did the building and I did the head. And I still remember that he said, but John will be very careful, the, the scale is terrible. Look at the beams only, the beams, it's the tallest building in Calgary. He said, don't worry because my scale is not the building, my scale is the people walking through. And, uh, and, and that piece that you have, you probably could see that it has two entrance, two doors, one in each side allow people to walk inside. And, and, and it's amazing because it's one of the dreams to have the possibility to, to be inside the head of somebody else, <laughs> which is the palace of dreams. It's really everything is in. And, and I got it with that project. And, and, and it's fantastic because it continues to be the same transparency, but when you in, are inside, look at, you can see the city through the face. And, uh, and and, and I, I think it's fantastic. It's my little homage to the surreal painters. Uh, and, 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 and becomes really one of the icons in the city. Now, I've been in Calgary two weeks ago for something else. And, and, and visiting the piece again, I was really moved by. It. Because when you are inside, you see this image, you know, the face in the sky and all the buildings around, the, the skyline of the city. Okay, that, I like it also to show you some other of the heads that I did in, in, in the same family of Wilsey's. I, I go quickly because it's a lot of images. 
and uh, in Chatsworth or in, in, in other places. For example, in Venice, in the Biennial, before the one that we did with Claire, in the Palazzo Franchetti near the Ponte dell'Accademia, I installed that, that head, which was, I guess, my first head in, in that way. It's the same seven meters tall. And, uh, and, and in the night, it's magic also in the way that it's reflecting on the building, the, sh the long, long shadow. Uh, the dialogue again, I, I mean, the pieces install it in a very similar way that Yorkshire Sculptor Park installed my piece now in front of the water. Slowly and slowly, uh, my relationship with the water is so well known that people like to put my pieces near, near the shore. And that I did the same, look at near the Grand Canale, and uh, I think it was a great installation. That is now in Harbour. Oh, that was last year, for all the year long, at, in London, near the Gherkin, with uh, Foster again. Uh, and uh, and they, they do this sculpture in the city, and they invite artists. Uh, and, and, and it was for one year, and now the piece is in Australia. Okay, that is in Toledo Museum. I like it, that photo, because you can see the columns. And, and the piece, like Wilsis, but when you look at the piece from one side, it seems that the piece disappeared. I love the pieces that... <clears throat> are trying to concentrate all, all the, all, let's say, all the volume in one side, but when you are moving around, the piece, it seems that it's disappearing, disappearing. And, and that, it's also a very moving picture for me because it was the installation of 11 alabasters in, in Yorkshire. Uh, I still remember Claire painting the plains and uh, I'm complaining always, and, and John T taking pictures. And, and uh, we did a great installation. And uh, that I, I write, install right now that piece in, in, the, in the Museum of, uh, of Art in Richmond. OK, and that piece that I love in Tokyo, it's a, it's a house that did this fantastic architect in King Gokuma. And, and I, I choose that piece that is almost floating in the water as the, my piece in Brazil, in a smaller scale as well. But you, you can see through the, through the windows, it's seen that it's a foggy air with the, the can, and, and I think it's a terrific installation. Okay, and, uh, and that is one of my preferred projects, obviously. It's the piece that I did in St. Helens years ago, you probably know. And it was an incredible relationship with the ex-miners of St. Helens. I, I learned so much. The, the, the name of the installation was Dream. And I get the name because one day talking, with, we, we, we installed our office in the pub of the village. And I remember talking with the ex-miners. One, one, one day told me, Jaume, you can't in, believe it. How dark is the pit 300 meters below? And for me, as as a guy from the Mediterranean, I never thought that light is really important. And for miners to be uh, in the complete darkness in the pit was really something. And he told me, the dark is so intense that light becomes a dream. It was really extraordinary. And I decided to entitle it Dream because finally it was this head like in a fairy tale appearing behind the trees in the, in, 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 in the hill. And it was visible from the M62, but also from the village, from the pub. And, and also, when we were all closer uh, nearby, this is me. <laughs> I love this picture. And uh, it was incredible because uh, for the opening, it was probably all the village walking up to celebrate the sculpture together because it was really for them uh, an incredible, uh, let's say, uh, uh, art in the village to feel them proud to be there. Uh, uh, they said, oh, sorry, they said uh, the, the, the curator with whom I did that project, Laurie Peak, unfortunately could not be here today. Uh, she was uh, uh, working for the Liverpool Biennial at the time. Uh, she said, uh, talking, well, uh, the, the quality of your work is that it's not making beautiful things. Your pieces are making beautiful the things around. 
And I think it's very important for me because I, talk, I mentioned before William Blake, One Thought Feels Immensity, this idea that the importance is not the object in itself, it's not the, the, the material in where you are carving, it's not the position, it's the capacity that one object has to fill up the space with energy. And, and I guess that is important, or oh, I'm trying it every time in my work. Uh, that is a project that I did at Madison Square Park uh, at the same year that I did the, 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 the Yorkshire Sculpture Park exhibition. It was a terrific project also for me, because in the heart of New York, I installed this head, boom, 14 meters tall. It was like an alien, boom, landing there. And, and nobody know exactly what to do with. And, and, and slowly and slowly, people was arriving, arriving, and sitting around. And, and it was a terrific experience. It was really a beautiful experience because you see the Empire State nearby and this verticality, but at the same time, the piece was facing the Iron Building, which is a little bit like my pieces. It's, it's the same volume, but with less space. And, uh, and, 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 and I guess it was really a popular spot during the six months that the show was on. And, uh, and it was great because a collector in Seattle took the piece and offered to the museum in Seattle. And, and, and thanks God, uh, they, they accept uh, to install the piece as I like it, obviously, in front of the water. <laughs> and, uh, and Echo, it was uh, really uh, the title of that piece because it was a time that I was really concerned about the, the, one of the main problems of today, I guess, because we have so much information all the time with the iPhone, with the news, with the TV, okay, everything that, well, it's my opinion, but finally I don't know if my thoughts are mine or are just a return or an echo of the others. And uh, I'm really concerned about that because we have not any more time to be with ourselves. And, and we say something and we don't know anymore if that is like echo. As you know, echo was a nymph Zeus fell in love with her, but she was already in love with somebody else. Well, the classic problem in Greece at that time. But <laughs> Zeus was the boss and he, he condemned her to live in a cave and always repeating the last words that she listened. And I feel many times like a coin a cave, repeating only the, the last words. And, and, and I thought it was a terrific uh, place in New York to talk about this problem. And, uh, but finally, Echo just went out of the cave and now is facing, you don't believe it. She's facing a mountain in front of the other side of the bay, call it Olympus. <laughs> I had not any idea, I have to say before. And, and I have with some friends, which I love, which is Marty Zubero and Calder over here. And it's a beautiful part right in front of the museum. Okay. That is a piece that I did two years ago in Sweden in a, in a completely isolated uh, island. It's nothing else than, than that now. And, and I think it's fantastic when you really install a piece for nobody, for nothing. And I think it's, it's great because I always thought that the sculpture is strongly related with divinity. Don't ask, I'm not religious, but don't ask me about which kind of God. But I love the concept of spirituality. And this idea that we have something that is around us. And I like it so much because the emptiness is so strong in that island that, I mean, I, I think it's a beautiful piece in a beautiful place. It's, a, it's about two hours north of Gothenburg. And, uh, and it's a little island surrounded with water. And, and I think it's a great piece. It's a show for three years. Uh, OK, that was a show also last year in, in my gallery in Paris, also trying to, to think about the same. This idea of uh, fairy tales, what is the relationship with the sculpture, with the space? As you know, I'm making uh, normally a lot of drawings. But what's happened with the drawing? Because the drawing, uh, in, my, in my case, is always trying to, to go out of the paper, out of the support, 
and I decided to do the drawings in the walls, which was much better. Uh, because finally you integrate the drawing with the sculptures and the sculptures with the walls and the architecture finally becomes part of the installation, which is many times the problem. And, uh, and, and, and I did this kind of installation called White Forest. I've been carving all the models on board. You see that they were trunks. And, uh, and, uh, and then I cast in bronze. It, you lose the boot, and then you lose the bronze when I painted the pieces in white. And people felt a little bit uh, uncomfortable to know what was the material, because many times we give too much importance in the sculpture to the material. And I guess the material is a bakel, but it's not the, 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 the last uh, function of the piece. We, materials is something that we need, but the importance is the message in the bottle. And, and, and the bottle is nice and it's good, but we have to lose sometimes the concept. And with that piece, it was great. That was a show at the, at the Max Ernst Museum in Germany, <coughs> end of last year. And I've been also making drawings, but to, to help of this group of uh, uh, heads in carpet and wood, which I'm burning. Okay, uh, sometimes the wall are not as beautiful as we imagine, or, or our life or our countries are in a strange situation. Uh, and, and, and in those pieces I was in the moment that I, it was not so convinced about many things. And I spent all my time burning all the heads, okay. And, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm always a very contradictory guy, burning the heads, but at the same time creating uh, heads completely transparent, translucent, with a lot of hope. I'm always in my work having this duality, heavy and lightness, you know. And, and those pieces were at the same show, and it was an incredible contradiction. That was the show after in January in New York. And I was insisting in this beautiful patina that I was finding burning this uh, yellow pine trees coming from all beams that I collect from demolish uh, buildings. Uh, I guess the beams are probably the most important part of a house or a factory or whatever, a construction, because it's holding, it's like our it's escalate, our bones in our body. It's holding all the structure of the building. And, and I've been collecting beams and with some pieces of beams, I curved the heads. You probably could recognize in the base the same shape of the beam. And, and I guess it was a fantastic show in New York. A little bit sad, but that was my, I don't know, my, 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 my attitude at the time. But connecting with the drawings to make a little bit of fairy tale with those girls, look at how beautiful with this, this kind of silence, the silence. I told you before the, the, the work of Elias Canetti, Silent Inn, and this attitude in the dialogue uh, together. That's me, obviously, making a drawing. And, and that is the last show that I did uh, at the Museum in saint Etienne in France, near Lyon. It's a very interesting museum for sculpture as well. And, and, I, I, and I did also a duality a very dark head in cast iron. They are smaller than the one that you have over here at Yorkshire. They are four, four and a half meters tall. The, the one in here is seven. With two heads, you know, the opacity and the transparency. Uh, I guess our life is a little bit in this strange scale, that uh, dark and light and lightness. And, uh, and, and, and I guess it's a, it's a beautiful show right before my show in Chicago, that is in my studio, with the new pieces. And I show you that before to show you the pieces in Chicago. That is my, is it still on, that show? I think it ends uh, end of November, I guess. And, and I did this group of heads in, in the stainless steel, which has this beautiful, strange color. It seems all silver, uh, with, with, with the globe, the sphere in the, in the end. As, as you probably remember, I did many of those pieces. It's like an sphere with, with a person uh, inside, like, as a self-portrait. And, uh, and, and in this old factory, which is a, it was a warehouse, uh, I, I guess those pieces seems that they are illuminated by the moon. 
look at this. And, and in the other side, it here is the globe, is the sphere. And in the other side of that conversation of head is a piece carved in wood, but is not barnet anymore. Because it's representing the position of silence, which is becoming for me the most important. It's a handic piece in that position, in a very concentrated attitude. Um, and, and, and I guess it's beautiful because it's the, the beginning and the end of the show. I, I like it to show that piece in the end, right before a new, a new image of Wilsey's. Uh, for me, it's not different, the one in Chicago or the one in Yorkshire. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really uh, in, in, the, in, in the way to try to produce, to fabricate, to insist about silence today. I guess to be silent don't means that you don't uh, talk more than another that is screaming. But I guess it's a very special time today, uh, our historical time in terms of politics, in terms of uh, ideas, in terms of communication. I, it, it's so noisy uh, in our, uh, the, the, we have to insist to fabricate silence because if you don't, we don't fabricate silence, the silence does not exist. <laughs> And, uh, and I guess, well, when I see the, uh, the site today, I've been very moved by it because they sent me pictures. They, they decided the position of that piece, and I guess they really choose the perfect spot for my sculpture. They know so well my work that they could do it. And uh, why? Because all those boots that seems the boots from the 19th century, the romantic moment, in where many people were thinking that the world was, the world was still possible to change. And, and they introduced Wilsey's, which was a young woman, uh, dreaming also to find a new world, a new possibility in their life, a new future. I, I, I think it would not be better. The water which belongs to all of us, the, the, a visitor, I think it's a jointy picture, but look at the animals. I think the bridge, it's, wow, if I was a professor, I could really talk about all the symbology that you can find in this picture. It's, it's it, it, well, I guess Tintoretto must be so, so jealous of that photo. Because everything is in, everything is in. And I'm really proud to be part of that picture. Thank you very much. had the right of wine, I, I only want it. <laughs> wow. It was okay. This is, um, I volunteer at the um, Sculpture Park, and um, a question that I get asked probably nearly every time I come is, is there going to be another Jean Pencil exhibition? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That. She volunteers here, and the, the question that she gets asked more than anything is, is there going to be another Jarl Plenser exhibition? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you must have with the boss. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, hi, just a visitor. Thank you so much for coming. I just had a, a query about uh, dreams. So I heard you talk a lot about dreams and I wondered how much your ideas come from dreams or whether it's more about a representation of dreaming. Wow. Well, um, many years ago, I've been uh, collaborating with doctors in the wall and we went to Sarajevo when it was the war there. I'm talking many, many years ago. I've never been in a 
country in war before. And I was really in, sh in the shock, very impressed. Because we have always the temptation to judge or to give advices to the others that, that they are in and the problems or with, I don't know. And um, at that moment in Sarajevo, it was a lot of forage collaboration of people. And I remember it was a group of French artists making an installation somewhere, uh, talking about the war. Uh, well, I felt it was completely surreal that somebody goes to a place in war to talk about war, okay? And, and I th thought a lot about what is our uh, responsibility as an artist because obviously as a man you or as a person you have a certain uh, responsibility with society but as an artist it seems that an artist is free to do whatever they like obviously it's fine it's lovely it's romantic I love that but to whom I have to direct my work who is my potential cyber my potential Visitor, I don't know how to say. Uh, and and, and, and uh, thanks to my poets, my friends, that they are there waiting always about me, uh, I decided that the, the most wild place in our body is the brain. It's completely out of our control. Every time people say, no, it's very rational, it's all in the brain, and it's completely wrong. When two ideas wants to meet, even if you don't like, they meet. And then, what is the situation? It's, and, and they meet in the darkness, in the humidity of our brain. It's a soft place where nothing seems clear. And, and the corner suddenly met two ideas. And I decided to follow that path in the way that probably following that path, my path, my dreams, I could be near of your dreams, your path. Because I could not be near of you in a different way than that. Because uh, I have not the, the correct information to talk about you or to talk to you. I, uh, but uh, you probably agree with me that somewhere we have a common memory, a common place that we can find each other. And that is my intention. I'm aiming always to try to reach that place in where you and I are similar and together. But honestly, I don't know where is that place or if I could reach one day. But in any case, I'm against completely all kind of art which is more journalist of one situation. I'm talking about human beings, not about you or him or her. I'm talking about us. And sometimes us means a very complex group of people and, 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 and that is my intention. Yeah, uh, well, thanks. That was just a fantastic uh, uh, talk and thanks for coming uh, along. Uh, yeah, my question was about uh, what's next and uh, what you're working on at the moment and uh, any, anything in the pipeline as to uh, further you mean exhibitions. My, my next project? Yeah, next project, further exhibitions. They said that it get, gets bad luck if you talk about the future project. <laughs> no, we are. We just finished the project in, in Montreal, and we installed also a piece in Bangkok, which is a very nice place. And, uh, and now we are working very strongly for a piece in LA, and, um, and we finished a piece for Toronto, but it's not installed yet. And then we started since two days, a huge sculptor for New York, which I'm very happy as well. And then we have a show in Stockholm, I guess, in, in, uh, in next summer. Yeah. And uh, in Madrid at the Reina Sofia in winter. And I hope in Barcelona, because I don't know if Barcelona will exist yeah. next year. <laughs> but... A lot of them. <laughs> so they'll follow it all with uh, interest. <laughs> I've got a couple of questions that are connected, I suppose. Do you acknowledge any particular influences from sculptors on your work? I mean, you talked about Blake. 
you talked about Tintoretto, but are there any particular sculptors that interested your work? Are they influenced your work? And a, a, perhaps a different way of putting that question is, um, you talked about your work being in dialogue with different sorts of architecture and different parks, different design spaces. Is your work in dialogue with any other particular sorts of sculpture? What do you mean? Other kind of directions? May other work people are making, other directions in sculpture, other well, forms of sculpture? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm making a lot of drawings, which is, which is, I feel very. Uh, well, actually, I don't know why I put not more drawings, but in any case, uh, I did a video, I did uh, photography, but probably I'm a sculpture. It's a destiny, it's not a decision, you know? And whatever that I have in mind, it's more heavy, more complicated than the present one. And, um, but I agree with you that the relationship or the cooperation between sculpture and architect is something natural in many times. I still remember in one talk, one person asked me, Mr. Plenser, what is the difference between architecture and sculpture? And I said the budget. <laughs> because many times we have tremendous capacity to dream about something, but we have not the budget. And, uh, but we, we are near because we are talking about something similar, which, which is the volume in relationship with one community. I think it's beautiful. And I learn a lot from architects in the way that they are always working in a scale one one, which I think is amazing because I have the capacity to work in many different scales, but not the architect. And, uh, and I think it's a conceptual is very strong, but it's also true that he has an advantage that we have not, that his buildings in general has a function. And many times art has this kind of a strange position that um, what is the, 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 the excuse to make one piece? Many times uh, decoration uh, to, to, to fill up uh, an emptiness or to cover the mistakes that an architect did before. <laughs> I don't know, many times when I've got a commission, it's a complicated question, but uh, when I'm doing my own exhibitions, well, it's different, but in any case, in, in the global, is because when, when you do your own work or when you are working in the public space, it's really completely different. And, uh, but I could tell you that art don't serve for nothing, and that is the strongest part of art. The day that art would accomplish a function is there. I mean, I guess it's probably the only thing in life that don't serve for nothing. Uh, and, and, and I think that it's our more a spiritual and romantic way to love. It's not just decoration, it's nothing else in that. It's a way to try to, to, to fix a dream into something, in, into a material. Uh, you probably agree with me that many times you, walking in the street, you cross with somebody that smiles in a way that it seems that this person is inventing the way to smile, or a perfume that it seems that you must to turn, what's that? Or a person that, make a movement or something that it seems that it was first time in humanity that this, but it's gone, it disappeared with. Why some people has the need to fix that in one paper, in one picture, in one sculpture, in one video, in one film, I don't know. But I guess these people has in some ways a certain, uh, let's say, complicity with society because Finally, all of us are using that memories later. And a good artist is when, I guess, it has the capacity, he has the, or she has the capacity to transform her own recalls into our memories. And that is when art comes up. The rest is just souvenirs. And, uh, and I think that it's the, doesn't matter if you are working in one or another media. The important is to try to catch something that could put all of us in touch and together. Hello, um, thank you so much. 
my question is really about your process um, and how you work, how you fabricate your pieces. I don't want you to give away any trade secrets, but what I'm interested in is when you were talking about the drawing and the scanning and the computer modeling, and then how you actually make those pieces. Um, in contrast with, for example, carving the, the beams, the wood, and the alabaster, that's, that's a reductive process where you're taking things away, rather than when you're kind of building things from scratch, scratch as it were. So just wondered if you could talk about that a little bit, please. Yeah. Uh, no, it's... Um, uh, my, my work as a sculptor is in some ways not so, uh, let's say, normal. We are friends with David Nash, and he's carving with the ash all the time, the trunk. I don't touch the trunk. Okay, uh, or I have friends working with a stone. I don't touch the stone. I try to touch nothing. It's a decision. I remember when I, I've been working in the beginning of my career, I was forging like a blacksmith. This arm was like this. I remember this not. <laughs> And, uh, and I really enjoy very much. I like the fire, the transforming material with fire, all the time with the hammer. And, uh, but slowly and slowly, I uh, moved to something trying to avoid completely my movement, you know? Uh, also, in my way to make drawings, in my way to make uh, sculptures. Then, uh, I found a terrific uh, people with incredible high skills, with this or that, uh, uh, craft people that really has uh, an amazing capacity. And together with what is wood is wood, when is marble is marble, bronze, cast iron, uh, etc. And, uh, and, and uh, when I found the right model for my pieces, uh, I scan the head, it's not even me, it's a technician who knows very well, okay. And then with my team in the computer, we develop that, and then we, I, I'm starting to imagine what to do with. And then the, the process starts with every one of those teams and technicians. But I don't touch nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, not, it's a decision. It was very complicated because uh, it, uh, I mean, it's, it's incredibly difficult, don't do it. To, uh, it's very difficult. But I guess I should do it, because uh, for many time I've been a little bit against that. Because an artist has a tremendous capacity to create f nice things, okay? And I am completely against that. I'm, I'm trying to reach beauty, not nice things. And, uh, and beauty for me is not a problem of shapes, it's an attitude. It's something that links us somewhere. I, I talked to her in that way. It's, it's a place. It's a, beauty is like the... They said that Internet is the sixth continent or seventh continent. Beauty is the wall, you know? And... and, and, and and I, I, uh, I don't like when artists love to enjoy themselves. You understand me? Okay, I touch nothing. Well, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that's it. Um, thank you very much for coming this evening. Um, I don't know what can I say. It's <laughs> it's always yeah. I don't I don't know. I I just feel like every time uh, Jeremy speaks, something expansive really happens. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you very much. join me in thanking Jeremy. Thank, thank you. you.